गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन रेस्पेक्टेड सतगुरु चकी वासदेव अंबेसडर अरुण सिंह डिस्टिंग गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन इट्स माई डिस्टिंग प्रेशर टू वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू हियर यू ऑल नो दैट टूडेज टॉपिक इज अबाउट रिलेवेंस ऑफ योगा इन मॉडर्न लाइफ बट टू एंजॉय दैट वी हैव टू डू avoid the interference of mobile phone in this hall okay please take a few seconds ensure that your phone is either switched off or in silent mode this event is a curtain raiser for the international day of yoga that's going to be celebrated on the june 21st 2015 and we are glad that Ambassador Singh has kindly agreed to be present here. He is no stranger to Washington, but still, I, please permit me to say a few words. In his long career from 1979, he has had a truly international diplomatic career, meaning when he was outside, he has done postings in Russia, Africa, Japan, and also at the India's office at the United Nations in New York. While he was back in Delhi, he has done postings relating to the whole of East Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, and also the United Nations policy making in Delhi. And he also headed the office of the Foreign Secretary and the External Affairs Minister. And he moved as India's ambassador to Israel in 2005. And uh, we were blessed to have him as the deputy chief of mission here from October 2008 onwards. And he left to Paris in April 2013 as India's ambassador and came back in April 2015 as if we planned it. <laughs> Because of this, extreme international exposure ambassador singh can speak russian and japanese and he knows a bit of french and hebrew but today he has kindly agreed to make a few remarks in english for us <laughs> please join me in welcoming ambassador singh Uh, thank you very much, Dharan. Uh, Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev, uh, it's an honor for us to have you here. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and, and let me just say how delighted uh, I am to be here with all of you. And uh, this is indeed uh, one of my first uh, public events after I have come back uh, to Washington, D.C. And so, so it's an honor to be able to share it with you. So in fact, I was joking and saying, that uh, I engineered my return a week ago to be present on this occasion. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming all of you tonight at the embassy. We are delighted that Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev has kindly agreed to talk on relevance of yoga in modern life as a curtain raiser to the first International Day of Yoga to be celebrated all over the world, including in Washington, D.C. on 21st June this year. As we all know, yoga is essentially a spiritual discipline which focuses on bringing harmony between mind and body. Today we will have an opportunity to listen to Sadhguru who has been guiding millions of people around the world in seeking this harmony and also between ancient yogic practices and contemporary lifestyle. Through his organization, the Isha Foundation, Sadhguru has been offering yoga programs that are transformational in nature. Furthermore, he and his team of volunteers are also focusing on large-scale humanitarian projects in the fields of education, environment, rural upliftment, and bringing science to children. No wonder Sadhguru has addressed major global forums, including United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the UK House of Lords, among others. His talk today would be a befitting precursor to highlight the importance of the first International Day of Yoga. 
When the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, addressed the United Nations on 27th September last year, he mentioned, and I quote, yoga is an invaluable gift of India's ancient tradition. It embodies unity of mind and body, thought and action, restraint and fulfillment, harmony between man and nature, a holistic approach to health and well-being. It is not about exercise, but to discover the sense of oneness with yourself, the world and nature. By changing our lifestyle and creating consciousness, it can help us deal with climate change. Let us work towards adopting an International Yoga Day. That was the call he had given. On 11 December, India had introduced a draft resolution in the United Nations General Assembly, which received broad support from 177 member states. This resolution was adopted without a vote and the United Nations declared 21st June as the International Day of Yoga. The Government of India, as I mentioned, is, is planning to celebrate this day in all countries, including USA. The Indian Embassy here would be organizing first International Day of Yoga celebrations on the National Mall at Silvan Theatre in association with yoga organizations in the region who have come together under the banner of Friends of Yoga. The event would be from 8.30 in the morning to 11 o'clock. And of course, all of you are invited. And please encourage others to also attend. It will be a free event, open for public. We would be presenting an exclusive video message on the occasion by the Indian Prime Minister. And the event would also feature yoga demonstration by experts and Indian dance and music. I once again welcome all of you here today and join you as we all wait to eagerly listen to the words of Sadhguru. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Ambassador has already mentioned, highlighted about Sadhguru. A few thoughts on this. One word is transformational. Whenever I read about Sadhguru, the word transformational comes. He works towards inner engineering and how one can transform. Another thing to note about so many gurus, and uh, this guru, what distinguishes him is that he doesn't uh, side with any religious uh, sentiments. What he does is something self-changing, transformational things. And uh, another thing which I felt very close to is that he has written more than about 100 books in eight languages, which means that he is continuously communicating with people with the purpose of transforming individuals, empowering individuals and transforming them. As Ambassador said, his association is also involved in large-scale humanitarian efforts. And uh, so he's the right person who can connect the old things in the new context. And we are all living a life where we are all, we all are aware that we are rushing somewhere and we don't know where, but we are doing very fast. And probably he will put some sense into what is happening here. Please join me in welcoming Sadhguru Jaggi Vasde. Sakalam karunam 
समयादिपते अखिलं करुणं Good evening. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> When we utter the word yoga, there are too many misconceptions as to what it is. <laughs> I think I'll take a few minutes as to where is the origin of yoga. Where does it come from? <clears throat> A little over fifteen thousand years ago, a yogi appeared in the upper regions of Himalayas. Nobody knew where he came from. His antecedents were completely unknown, nor did he care to introduce himself. People gathered in thousands, but then he said, he said nothing, he did nothing. He simply sat there, unmoving. People waited hoping for a miracle to happen, nothing happened. Their idea of a miracle was fireworks in the sky and nothing like that happened. He simply sat there. Slowly people started leaving because he's not saying anything, doing anything, eyes closed, you can barely make out whether he's alive or not. Once in a way tears of ecstasy are dripping down his cheeks, otherwise nothing is happening. Then everybody left, only seven people stayed on because they recognized the miracle. So the nature of our body is such, to keep it in any decent state, you have to attend to daily compulsions. You have to eat, you have to drink, you have to relieve yourself, you have to sleep. All these things are happening, it sits here in a decent manner. Any one of these things are not fulfilled, then it will go into another state. Here he simply sat here for months on end, unmoving. So these people, these seven people recognized that unless someone has transcended their physical nature, one cannot sit like this. So they waited for his attention. After many months, his attention fell upon them and they begged, please, whatever you are experiencing, we would like to know. He was a little dismissive, he said, this is not entertainment. But they said they're willing to do anything. So he gave them a few preparatory steps with which they worked on and after that for many years his attention did not fall upon them. When the summer solstice approaches, every yogi makes a certain adjustments within himself because whatever happens to the planet naturally happens to this body. Because this body is a product of the way this planet and this solar system is functioning. This is like the potter's wheel by which this has been made. He went into an elaborate science of this later but to make it very simple, this much is clear to all of us, there's an, there's an elaborate science and mathematic involved in this but leaving that aside, at least this much we understand that if our mother's bodies were not in sync with the moment of the moon, the cycles of the moon, we wouldn't be born. Hmm? Only because it's in sync with this. Similarly with the solar cycles, certain other dimensions of our bodies are in sync with it and the revolutions of the planet, all these things together are made this body the way it is, the made the evolutionary process the way it is. Then he gave this and when he was making these adjustments after many years, when the solar solstice came, which is the twenty-first of June, it's very significant that the yoga day is fixed on that day, then he noticed these seven people had become fantastic receptacles. They have been preparing for years and he never noticed them. When he saw this level of receptivity, he could not ignore them anymore. So, somewhere around this twenty-first of June, he turned south because the sun turned south. This is called as from Uttarayana to Dakshinayana, it turned in yoga. From solar, from June to December is known as Sadhana Pada. 
from December to June is called as Kaivalya Pada. This is the time of sadhana. So he turned south and sat there as the Adi Yogi, Adi Guru. He, they called him Adi Yogi because they did not know his name, so they said he is the first yogi. So on this day he sat as the Adi Guru or the first guru to throw light upon the nature of human existence. So he explored human mechanics in as much elaborateness as you can imagine and he came up with 112 ways in which, through which a human being can at attain to his highest. Having delivered this over a period of time, these seven people took to various parts of the world, he asked them to go ahead and do this. One stayed with him, the other one came to what is now considered as the Indian part of Himalayas. Another one went to Central Asia, another went to North Africa, another went to South America. One went down South India who is most important for us, he is known as the father of Southern mysticism, this is uh, <coughs> Agastya Muni. And another one went to South Asia. Today also, I think recently about three weeks ago there was news saying that under a temple, under a pyramid in uh, Mexico, there is huge quantities of mercury. Mercury and yoga and Indian alchemy are very closely related. And there are any number of stories in the yogic lore as to how what happened in Southern America some many, many years ago, thousands of years ago. Leaving that aside, the historicity, what is yoga? The word yoga means union. Union of not just body and mind, union of everything. Today modern science is telling you, the whole existence is just one energy manifesting itself in millions of ways. The religions of the world have been screaming for a long time that God is everywhere. Whether you say everything is one energy or you say God is everywhere or you're talking about the same reality or a different reality, different ways of expression, we are saying the same thing. Now, it is just that a scientist does not experience this, he has mathematically deduced it. A religious person does not experience this, he believes it because it's said by somebody that he values. A yogi is a hard nut, he wants to know it by his own experience. How is it possible for one to know that he is one with everything or everything is one with him? Let me try to put it as simply as possible. There's a glass of water here, I'm sure this is not you, isn't it? Hello. It's not you, but if you drink it, it becomes you, isn't it? Seventy-two percent of your body is water. What is not you becomes you how? What is it that defines what is you and what is not you? We'll just do a simple experiment right now. Take your right hand and touch your left hand, please. Is that you? You must confirm to me, please. Is that you? Yes. yes. Touch the chair on which you're sitting. Is that you? How do you know this? What is the basis, what is the basis of your experience which tells you this is me and this is not me? Sensation, isn't it? Here there is sensation or in other words what you're saying is whatever is within the boundaries of my sensation is me. Whatever is outside the boundaries of my sensation is not me, isn't it? Right now this is not within the boundaries of your sensation what is called as drinking is you are including it into the boundaries of your sensation. The very body that you carry, whatever number of kilograms you carry, it's just a piece of the planet, isn't it? Hmm? Yes or no? You must get it now. If you don't get it now, one day you will get it from the maggots and it's a bit late. <laughs> if you get it now, you can transform your life. What you carry as your body is just a piece of this earth countless number of people who walked this planet before you and me, they were also smart people. Where are they? They're all topsoil. This will also become topsoil unless your friends choose to bury you real deep. No, because some people fear you may raise from the dead, you know. I heard that ambassador was uh, in Israel. This happened. A couple 
from Texas. Over 75 years of age, been wanting to visit the Holy Land for a long time. And at last, when they were over 75, they made the trip. They were totally overwhelmed. All the historicity, you know every cobblestone in Jerusalem is full of history. The, the lane that Jesus walked, the place where he walked upon the water, where things happened, they were overwhelmed by this whole thing. And unfortunately, the wife had a heart attack and she died. Now the local people who, who deal with these things, they came to the man and said, see if you have to transport your wife's body to Texas, it costs twenty-six thousand dollars. If you do it here, all the rituals will finish for ten thousand dollars. Twenty-six thousand plus whatever the local charges there. Then uh, the man thought about it and said, you know, no, I'm taking her to Texas. Then they said, why? Okay, we'll make it five thousand. Five thousand. He thought about it and said, no, I'm taking her to Texas. They said, this doesn't make sense. Twenty-six thousand dollars for the plane, for, for, for the, you know, taking the body, transportation and then local charges, why? All right, we'll make it thirty-six hundred. It's a land of bargain, you know. He thought about it and said, no. Then they asked, why? It doesn't make sense. He said, in Texas, dead stay dead. <laughs> so, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you think about yourself, doesn't matter where you think you are going, where all you have been, as far as your physical body is concerned, it is going straight to the grave without hesitation, not one moment is it faltering, going straight there because this is a material that you picked up. The only way you made it yours is by including it into the boundaries of your sensation. It is a known fact that if you, if you experience a very exuberant moment in your life, let's say, you're very joyful, are very loving to a point where tears came to you. Happened to you? You're so joyful, tears came to you. At such a time, if you just place your hands just six, eight inches away from yourself, right here you'll feel sensations. If no such wonderful thing happened to you, we'll have to do something horrible. <laughs> we'll cut your leg right now. If you take off your right leg, the physical leg will be gone but still the sensory leg may stay intact for some time. You've heard of this? It's called the phantom leg. If you suddenly take off the leg, all the sensations of the leg will still remain for a period of time. Sometimes for days on end, it stays. Or in other words, the sensory body has a presence of its own. If you make the life within you very exuberant, full-fledged life, if you become, sensory body will expand. If you sit here and if your sensory body became as large as this hall, as that which was not you yesterday has become you today, isn't it? If you sit here, you, if you could experience all these people just as you experience the five fingers of your hand, not psychologically thinking or emotionally feeling we are all one, but actually if you experience them as yourself. After that, do I have to teach you morals? Do I have to tell you don't harm this person, don't kill this person, don't rob this person? Do you need morality like this? Anything that you have known as myself, with that you are perfectly fine, isn't it? So if you sit here and make your life energy so intensely vibrant that your sensory body became as large as the universe, then we say you are in yoga because everything you experienced as myself, even if you did not stay in that experience, even for a moment if you experience this, the fundamental way in which you perceive and experience life is altered. This is the basic aspect of yoga, that to extend, to make this life energy so intense that your sensory body, the area becomes so large that if you sit here in your experience everything is you. There is nothing else but you. Only if you are here, no trouble, isn't it? You and the other is trouble. 
Now there are various other aspects to it, there is health, there is happiness, there is peacefulness, all these things. These things can be addressed in so many different ways. One simple way of putting it is, suppose you lose your peace today, what will happen? First dose of your lack of peace, the family will get it. The hmm? so one or two people at home, they will get the first dose. <laughs> you went and yelled at your family, people thought it's normal. Tomorrow it continued, you, you'll pick a quarrel with your neighbor. If it continues, you start yelling at somebody on the street. If it continues tomorrow, you go and shout at your boss. The moment you shout at your boss, everybody understands that you need medical help. <laughs> so if they take you to your doctor, initially the doctors try to talk you out of it. Doesn't usually work. So the next thing is they throw a pill into you. A pill means what? Certain number of chemicals. If you take these chemicals in, suddenly you become peaceful. Maybe not forever, at least for that period of time it works. Or in other words, what you call as peace is a certain kind of chemistry. What you call as joy is another kind of chemistry. What you call as ecstasy is one kind of chemistry. Agony is another kind of chemistry. Misery is another kind of chemistry. Anxiety is another kind of chemistry. Stress, whatever you call it, pleasantness or unpleasantness that happens within you, every human experience has a chemical basis to it. Or in other words, this is a chemical soup. Are you a great soup or a lousy soup? That's a question. If I give the same ingredients to ten different people here and ask them to make soup, they will turn up ten different kinds of soups, isn't it? Same ingredients. All of us same ingredient, just see how different each person has made himself. Now the entire science of making this into a pleasant soup, this is one important dimension of yoga, but it's not the goal of yoga. If your body becomes pleasant, we call this health. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. Only to create your surroundings in a pleasant manner, you need the cooperation of many forces around you. But to make your body pleasant, mind pleasant, emotion pleasant, energy pleasant, you need the cooperation of just one person. That's you. External co pleasantness, you need the cooperation of many, many forces. Not always is it possible. But internally, only if you are willing, it's very much possible. So the science of yoga, looked at various possibilities, how to make this entire system pleasant. To be pleasant, to be joyful or to be even ecstatic is not a goal by itself. It is a fundamental ambience that is needed if you want to explore the full depth and dimension of your life. If you want to enjoy your dinner tonight, at least you must be peaceful and happy, isn't it? Whether you want to enjoy your work or your family or the people around you or the spring around you, you must at least be peaceful and happy. So to be peaceful and happy is not the ultimate goal of your life. It is the most fundamental requirement of your life. If you become like this, that you're pleasant by your own nature, not because of something that's happening around you, your pleasantness is created by you and it stays that way within you, this means you have no fear of suffering. Only when there is no fear of suffering, will you dare to explore life in its full depth and dimension. Otherwise, always what will happen to me is always the big question. It's a crippled life. As long as fear of suffering exists within you, you will never dare to take full steps. Your life will not be full stride, it will be always a half a step. So to set this you have to create a chemistry of blissfulness, whatever, this is the way I am. If this assurance is there, you can jump into anything and do whatever. Or in other words, you are never an issue. 
you have made yourself in such a way that you are not an issue. Outside there are many issues. We'll deal with it to the extent we can, uh, to the extent the situation allows us, but you are never an issue. At least this much everybody should do to themselves, isn't it? I don't know if you will become the richest man in the world or not. I don't know whether you will climb Mount Everest or not. I don't know whether you will run faster than Mr. Bolt or not. These things will need many things. But at least your experience on this planet should be pleasant. This is something fundamental. This is something every human being needs and deserves. At least this much happen, this much must happen. At least this level of yoga we want the entire world to do. Yes, at least this level of yoga. They become peaceful and happy by their own nature. Whether they get realized, whether they will become yogis, whether they will experience the whole cosmos, that's left to them. At least making their life a pleasant experience. This much everybody must do. This much must happen. It is with this vision, I think the International Yoga Day, so that the world takes to this science. For a long time in pursuit of human well-being, we've looked up. By looking up, people have gone into all kinds of hallucinations and we've fought wars, we've divided the world in ways we can't fix it. Terrible things we've done to each other and continue to do even today. So many people started looking out for their well-being. In pursuit of human well-being, we are ripping the planet apart, but well-being is not happening. Because if you want to feel well, if you want to know well-being without turning inward, there is no well-being. By doing things outside, you can create comfort, you can create convenience, but you cannot create well-being. As a generation of people, we are the most comfortable generation ever on the planet. Do you agree with me? Another generation of people could never imagine the kind of comforts and conveniences that we are enjoying right now. Never before. But can you claim you are the most joyful generation on the planet? Or the most peaceful one or loving one? That has not happened. Simply because by engineering the external world, we may create comfort and convenience, but only by engineering your inter interiority, well-being can happen. This dimension of inner engineering is what yoga is about, looking at the mechanics of life, the technologies and tools for creating inner well-being. When I say tools, see as human beings, we have a place, we hold the place that we hold on this planet, mainly because of our ability to use the tools. Otherwise, in many ways, almost every creature is better than us, but we can use tools and they cannot use tools, that's a big difference. That has set us apart in a huge way. Now, as there is objective tools to create external situations, there are subjective tools to create inner situation. This is what yoga is about. It is not a teaching, it is not a philosophy, it is not an ideology, nor a belief system. These are technologies for well-being. Why I'm insisting on it being a technology is, you just have to learn to use it. It doesn't matter who you are, if you learn to use it, it works. That's the thing about technology. So yoga is a technology, all you have to do is learn to use it. It is not that you believe it, it's not that you disbelieve it, it's not about that because it's a certain subjective tool. If you learn to use it, it will definitely work for you irrespective of who you are and what you are. These tools just enhance a human being. In your life, if you think the work that you're doing is important, first thing is you must work upon yourself. We have been striving to bring this to the leadership in the world, Today I can proudly say many states in India have taken this up, the entire administration doing inner engineering process and finding enormous benefit. We have touched almost 42 to 43 percent of the bureaucratic, you know, set up in southern India, which has made a big difference for them. When I was at the economic forum, I was asked, Sadhguru, if there's one thing we can do for you which will make a difference in the world, what is that? I said, there are twenty-five people I want. You give me these twenty-five people for four days or five days. 
you will see in three years' time, there will be significant change on the planet. So they asked me, who are these twenty-five people? I named the twenty-five heads of state. And it's fantastic today, a major nation, heads of major nations are talking about yoga for the first time. I want you to understand, this has lived for over fifteen thousand years without any kind of one organization pushing it or forcing it, never in the history of humanity has it happened, somebody put a sword to your throat and say, you must do yoga, otherwise we'll kill you. No such thing has ever happened. <laughs> Simply because of its efficacy, because it works, it's lived. Today, nearly two billion people on the planet are doing some form of yoga. I'm not happy with that. I want the 7.2 billion people to do some form of yoga because it is time. We have looked up, we have looked out and we have caused much damage. It is time the world turns inward for their well-being, not up, not out, in. In is the only way out really. If you want well-being, in is the only way out. And we want this to happen and it's fantastic that heads of states, the prime minister took this up and the United States leadership is responding. Even the word yoga being uttered by the President of the United States is a very big thing and he's uttered it too many times in the last few months, <laughs> which is great. And I hear that among all the UN resolutions, this got the maximum support, some 172 countries. Hmm? 177 countries. That's truly fantastic that all of them recognize this. This is not about selling a product to people, let this be understood. This is not about propagating a particular culture. This is not about making, converting everybody into Indian, no. This is about understanding a fundamental science of well-being. As we… there is a science and technology for external well-being, there is a whole science and technology for inner well-being and this must happen and for the first time, in the world. We are in a position, we are on the threshold position. Never before another generation has had this privilege that today we have the necessary resource, capability and technology to address every human problem on the planet. Never before was this possible. Only thing that's missing is an inclusive consciousness of human beings. And this is what yoga can do beyond religion, beyond belief systems, beyond caste, creed, race, nationality, people can experience a deep sense of unity within themselves, which is what the world needs. The external technologies are going through the ceiling, but who is handling these technologies will decide whether well-being will come or disasters will come. Outside science and technology that we… the modern science and technology that we have, they have no character of their own. They are neither good nor bad. It all depends in whose hands they are. If you do not improve the quality of the hands which hold these powerful instruments, today as you sit here you must understand you are not human beings anymore compared to how they were thousand years ago. Today you are superhuman beings. Tell me, hundred years ago if I could pull out something from my pocket and speak to someone in India right now, and if I claimed I am God, would you believe me or not? A thousand years ago, if I just had a light bulb, I could have become God, you know? This damn cell phone came to me very late. <laughs> so I am saying in every way, we have become superhuman in our capability. When such capability is… we are privileged by such capability, the necessary responsibility which is not as a teaching, not as an idea, but you will have a deep sense of responsibility towards everything that you experience as myself, isn't it? It's good that uh, the last part of the message from the Prime Minister, he said this could be an ecological solution, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. If you do not understand that this water is your life, we must starve you for five days of water and then one drop of water you will worship it, isn't it? Yes or no? This is life making material, this is not a commodity, this is not something that you buy and sell, unfortunately it's become like that, but this is life making material. 
the air that you breathe the water that you drink the food that you eat the earth that you walk upon this is life making material isn't it if you do not experience a certain unity with all these things then the way you live will be crash which is what we are doing today what we step on we are not connected with this what we breathe we are not connected with this what we drink and eat we are not connected with this and then we are wondering why we are not well the fundamental aspect of yoga the most basic aspect of yoga is called bhut shuddhi that means purifying the five elements within you this body is just a play of five elements so is the planet so is the universe so is the entire creation just five ingredients just see what magic if you just manage these five ingredients properly within your system being healthy being ecstatic is not out of reach this is not a pipe dream this is technology if you're willing to employ it every human being is capable of it let's understand this when it comes to external realities we are all differently capable what you can do i cannot do what i can do somebody else cannot do when it comes to external realities all of us are differently capable when it comes to inner possibilities all of us are equally capable it's not happened simply because we've never paid attention to it it's great at last we're talking about international yoga this means we are beginning to understand that we have to turn inward this is a great momentous event how big it will become this year it doesn't matter this has to be continued because this is a momentous step that humanity is taking right now most people may not understand the significance of what this is they may think there is a bubble bath day you know yesterday was a mothers day and um, mothers day was started by the nazis the hitler's time <laughs> and we are celebrating it anyway uh, all these things there is also a bubble bath day there are all kinds of things every all the 365 days have been taken by somebody no, for a normal person there is no day left <laughs> this is not one more thing like that this has to become a momentous step for humanity because this taking not looking upward or outward for well being but turning inward for well being is a step that humanity has, humanity has to take and human intellect has blossomed like never before that more people are capable of thinking for themselves than ever before in the history of humanity when this has happened offering solutions in another place somewhere is not going to work people want solutions here once they want solutions here turning inward is a natural process and it's very significant that this day has been declared and it's a it's a moment of great pride uh, for us because a political leader has taken this stance not yogis political leader has taken this stance it's a fantastic and very visionary step which will go a long way thank you very much if you have any question i could address a question Sadhguru ji, it's a great honor to see you and hear you talk personally. We welcome you to DC. And just um, talking about inner peace and turning inward, I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, there are all sorts of people in the world and if a person is living in abject poverty and fighting each day to feed a hungry family or a sick family or street beggars who are maimed at childhood etc how does that person even if have the time to look inward considering the struggles he has to go through hour to hour thank you <laughs> i know this is always there it's not that i'm not concerned about it but i want you to understand there are more people on this planet who are healthy and miserable than unhealthy and miserable yes so no at least if you are unhealthy you got a good excuse healthy people have no excuse but they are miserable too so why is this happening if instead of addressing human well being in an essential way we always want to look at the scabs that humanity has yes there are still many things that have to be settled there are war zones there are famine zones there are ugly patches on the 
planet which have to be fixed, all that is there. But let me talk about you and everybody like you, whose stomachs are full, everything that you need is around you. Compared to your parents and your grandparents, materially you are way ahead of them, yes or no? Way ahead of them. But I'll ask you a simple question, how many of you can say at least one day in your life, that is one twenty-four hour segment in this entire life, have you spent absolutely blissfully, not a moment of agitation, irritation, anger, anxiety, nothing, simply blissed out. I'm telling you, even a handful of people on the planet cannot say yes to this. If one day did not happen the way you want it, that's understandable. But not even one day happened the way you want it, that means something fundamentally is off the rack, isn't it? The reason why somebody is not able to eat, let me tell you, in 2011, it seems the world produced enough food for 7.2 billion people. We were only 6.8 billion people on that day. But still half the population doesn't eat. Why do you think? <laughs> That's not the point. It's good somebody grows ahead. The problem is there's no inclusiveness. There's no sense of you have, we are in a state that somebody else's suffering is not our suffering, all right? So what is needed is a more inclusive experience on the planet. If we did not have food and people are hungry, that's okay, what to do, that's a reality. We have enormous food and people are hungry, that's a crime, isn't it? Yes? It's not a disparity, it's a crime. When there is excessive food on the planet and half the population is hungry and malnourished, it's a serious crime as far as I'm concerned. If only now that the leadership is talking, I am saying those twenty-five peoples I talked about <laughs> of the major nations, if they experienced everything around them as a part of themselves, in, in one year or two years' time, significant change can happen on the planet, isn't it? It's not happened because we are always going by this, because we like to go on plucking our wounds and going on focusing on that. Okay, that child was not eaten on the street, what about this mind person, what about this war? All those things are there. Are you interested in the problems on the planet or are you interested in solutions on the planet? If you are interested in solutions, taking an inward step, particularly for all those people who hold responsible positions in the world is important because once you are a leader, what it means is every thought that you generate, every emotion that you generate, every action that you perform is going to impact millions of people. When such a privilege is at hand, how you should keep yourself is important, isn't it? No such work has been done. Our whole idea of education right now is how to enhance our capability, not to enhance the being. I am saying if you enhance this being, your activity will naturally rise. Now without enhancing the fundamental life within you, you are trying to enhance your activity which is horribly stressful. Because you mentioned the word peace, peace is not even an issue. When you are five years of age as a child, being peaceful and happy, was it not natural to you? Hmm? So at five if you were peaceful and joyful, by the time you are thirty you should have become ecstatic. But just the reverse happened. So we have to see what are we doing wrong, isn't it? Today everybody is going about talking as if peace is the ultimate goal of their life. Even so-called spiritual leaders are talking about it. Believe me, such people will only rest in peace. Yes, <laughs> because, because of certain deprivation these things are being said. I must tell you this because the ambassador has been in Tel Aviv. <laughs> I was to speak in Tel Aviv a few years ago. I flew in from Atlanta, I am supposed to land there in the morning and speak at 6.30 in the evening. But because of some delays, I landed there at 6 in the evening. So I quickly changed in the airport, I am rushing to the place because in these thirty-three years of my activity, I have not been late to a single appointment yet. So I am rushing there. And I have been flying an American airline, there is nothing edible on the plane, so I am starved. 
To my joy, I see the venue where I am supposed to speak happens to be a wonderful restaurant. I said, this is great. As I walked in, people were greeting me and one man came and said, Shalom. I said, fine, what does that mean? He said, this is the highest way of greeting. I said, that's your opinion, but what does it mean? He said, no, no, this is really the highest way of greeting. All right, but what does the word mean? He said, this means peace. Then I said, why would peace be the highest way of greeting unless you're born in Middle East? <laughs> in South India, somebody comes up to me in the morning and says, peace. I'll say, what's wrong with you today? <laughs> Whatever you're deprived of becomes the highest thing. These are all simple things. To be peaceful, to be joyful, to be loving is human nature, isn't it? If you don't mess yourself up, if you don't know this, get yourself a dog. When all other people fail you, you'll get a dog, you know. If you want to learn some joy, some love, at least get a dog. <laughs> You don't need to go to heaven to this, but unfortunately today if you say peace, people say divine peace. If you say bliss, you say divine bliss. If you say love, you say divine love. We don't know whether divine can love or not. If human being keeps himself well, he can be peaceful, joyful, loving. All that is human quality, please do not export it to heaven. We don't know whether it's useful there or not. Here it's useful to be peaceful, to be joyful, to be loving <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I really like your concept of internal engineering and technology and this has been evolved for the last uh, several thousand years. I notice that a lot of uh, this technology is being compromised by through different types of yogas, hot yoga and Christian yoga and such and such yoga. Uh, do you think the technology is being compromised, uh, uh, the internal engineering is being compromised or the definitions are being compromised? So the thing is, uh, when there is… Uh, this is a market economy, the whole world right now, okay? including Russia and China. <laughs> so when it's a market economy, it's all a question of demand and supply. There's enormous demand, not enough supply. So just about anybody and everybody is trying to invent their own form of yoga, okay? It could be dangerous over a period of time, but right now I think it's all right because they're generating interest. <laughs> But classical yoga is of a different nature. This is the work I feel this international day, this is what we need to do to bring the profoundness of yoga to the West because only the physical of yoga has come largely. To make it a profound process is the most important work. But whatever this other types of yogas you're talking about, you don't have to fear them, they're okay. These are things which always happen when things happen large scale, things happen. But today somebody will do that kind of fanciful yoga, even if it benefits them a little bit, then they will look for something more profound and more profound, that will happen. But making profound classical system of yoga largely available to the world is important. Right now, the important thing is not getting demand. There is too much demand. To give supply is the biggest problem because it will take months and years to train a person properly to classical system of yoga. It will take years of practice. And in today's world, one very scarce material is dedication. In a weekend you can become a teacher. So <laughs> if I tell you three years you must come and study with me. Uh, because somewhere else in two weekends you're certified, okay? That's okay, that's part of the commercial process, but I think it'll level out somewhere. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guruji. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, I'm really very much awake and delighted about… Uh, I'm glad your... you're awake <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and uh, 
as you know, uh, the yoga is trans transforming the health. And as you mentioned, that the time will come or the, it will transform to the humanity to take care of the neighbors and all humanity. It will take time or is reaching there because we are all very much mature with the knowledge but not with the science behind that. Wherever there's inability or incapability about a plan, they always fall back on prediction. Please don't fall back on predictions. I am asking you, when will you make it happen around you? What is your plan? <laughs> International Yoga Day is a plan, not a prediction. No, that is exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying there's no guarantee it'll transform. If we do the right things, it will happen, otherwise it will not happen. There are many great things on which we have sat on for too long and nothing has happened, all right? So, I'm saying we have to make it happen, nothing happens out here. Um, a long time ago, my grandfather gave me an article by, written by you and you said that everyone's trying to be yeah, extraordinary. I'm not that old as your grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that, but uh, you started pretty young, I guess, in yoga. So, um, the article ended with you saying that, you know, everyone's trying to be extraordinary, uh, but being ordinary is extraordinary. And um, that stuck with me and my grandfather, the reason he gave me that article was because he said that just try and be yourself and whatever uh, comes to you, just go with the flow and have some detachment that will take you very forward in life. And I've lived my life through that with, it, with what he wanted me to be. But I wanted to ask you, don't you think that the kind of dedication and detachment that's required to go with the flow is extraordinary. <laughs> this whole thing came up because at one time we used to print brochures like this, inner engineering, ordinary to extraordinary. <laughs> so I start the program, first day, second day. Uh, third day people are Sati, Sadhguru, nothing special happened to me. <laughs> then I said, I never talked about being special. Said extraordinary, you said? I said, yes. This is about becoming extraordinary, <laughs> more ordinary than others. <laughs> the sickness in the world is you always want to be better than somebody, which is a great sickness. If you enjoy somebody else being less than you, I think it's sickness. Hmm? Right now, the whole thing is about who is number one, who is number two. What's wrong with number hundred, I'm asking. Everybody has a place to fulfill, everybody has a role to play in the world. So instead of living by comparison, if you see how to make this life into a full-fledged life, see this is what by nature every life is seeking. Whether it's an earthworm or a grasshopper or a tree, what are they seeking? They're just striving to become full-fledged what they are nothing more. But it's easy to define what is a full-fledged earthworm, what is a full-fledged grasshopper, what is a full-fledged apple tree, we can define. What is a full-fledged human being, we are not able to define. Because wherever we keep you, you want to do something more, isn't it? Yes or no? Whoever you are right now, you want to be something more. If then something more happens, what? Something more. If that happens, what? Something more. Let's say we made you the queen of this planet. Don't look at me hopefully <laughs> I will not make such blunders, I'm just asking you. Suppose we make you the queen of this planet, would you be fulfilled? You will look at the stars, isn't it? That is the nature of the human being. The very nature of who you are is that you want to expand limitlessly. You want infinite expansion, but unfortunately you are going at it in installments. Can you approach infinity in installments? Can you count one, two, three, four, five and one day say infinite, is it possible? No, it's endless counting. 
The very nature of who you are is such, suppose I imprison you right now in five by five cubicle for three days, you will feel horribly imprisoned, then we'll announce your liberation and liberate you into a ten by ten cubicle. You will feel wonderful for a day, again you'll feel imprisoned. Now we'll liberate you into a hundred by hundred cubicle, you will feel great for three days, again the same thing. It does not matter where I set the boundary, the moment you can feel the boundary, you want to break it. Yes or no? So there is something within you which does not like boundaries. There is something within you constantly longing to become boundless. But the only problem, this is a fantastic goal for you, you are seeking to become boundless or infinite is not a small thing. But the method you are employing, the vehicle you are using to get there is hopeless. Because through physical means you are trying to become boundless. The very nature of physicality or the fundamentals of physicality is a defined boundary. Only because there is a boundary, physical is possible. Right now we call this a physical body because it has a defined boundary. If I take away all the boundaries of this body, can you call this physical? So the fundamentals of physicality is boundary, but your innermost longing is to become boundless. Through physical means, if you approach boundlessness, it's going to be an endless run. So the entire dimension of what is being referred to as spiritual is just this. Spiritual does not mean you see things walking in the corners of dark streets. <laughs> spiritual does not mean you look up or down, no. It is just that your experience of life has transcended the physicality of who you are. Because physicality, as we looked at it some time ago, is something that you accumulated over a period of time. What you accumulate, you can claim is yours. But if you say it's me, you kind of lost it, isn't it? Suppose suddenly I show you this glass and this is my glass, you will think, well, Sadhguru has some problem. But let's listen some more. People say he is wise. After some time I say, this is me. Then you'll say, let's go. Because this is a clear case of madness, isn't it? This is happening to you every day. Food appears on your plate, you say, this is my food, you eat it and then it's me. Once you start thinking, what is not you as myself, your fundamental perspective of life is distorted. From that distortion, whatever you do, it will only be a struggle because it will not find fulfillment. At least you must be able to see what is me and what is not me. This is the fundamentals of inner engineering. If you sit here, body is here, mind is out here, what is you is somewhere else. Once there is a little space between you and your body, between you and your mind, this is the end of suffering because you know only two kinds of suffering, physical suffering, mental suffering. Do you know any other kind of suffering? This is the only two things which are bothering you. Both these things are miracles. Human body is a miracle, human mind is a fantastic miracle. But both these things have become misery manufacturing machines right now. Simply because you have a supercomputer and you have not even bothered to read the user's manual. This is the problem with you. This International Yoga Day, you must at least start reading the user's manual. What is the nature of this? Let's start looking at this. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Guruji. I would like to congratulate and uh, the Mr. Arun Singh being here as the U.S. Uh, Indian Ambassador to United States and uh, he will be marshalling or, uh, you know, leading this International Yoga Day in this part of the world. Thank you very much to doing this one. Can I request uh, Ambassador Arun Singh to give a bouquet to Sadhguru, please? On behalf of all of us, please join us. All of you are requested to join us for refreshments in this room. Please, thank you. Thank you.